Well, good afternoon. On behalf of the University of Arizona and Arizona Arts, I want to thank you for joining us for this pre press briefing for the return of Willem de Kooning's Woman Ochre to the University of Arizona Museum of Art. And I'm delighted we're here in the very room where this painting will be, be, dis be displayed for the next six months or so. My name is Andy Schultz, and I'm the Vice President for the Arts and the Dean of the College of Fine Arts here at the University. Before we begin today's press conference, I want to take a moment to address yesterday's campus shooting. All of us associated with the university were horrified and saddened to learn that one of our colleagues, Professor Thomas Meixner, had been shot and killed yesterday afternoon. Thomas Meixner was a University of Arizona professor and head of the Department of Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences. He studied how water influences biology and geology across diverse environments with a focus on the American Southwest. Tom was a cancer survivor whose positive approach to life inspired his faculty, students, and colleagues. He was a beloved member of the university community, and he will be missed. We're still processing this senseless and tragic event and the continuing epidemic of gun violence in this country. Our hearts go out to Dr. Meixner's family, his friends, his students, and the entire Tucson community. Please join me in a moment of silence honoring Dr. Meixner. Thank you. And I'll add that President Robbins, who had planned to be here, was in, unable to do so because of these events and his response to them. Um, so obviously this is a time of, of, of sadness for us in many respects, but it's also um, a time of celebration. And the return of this painting is, is a remarkable uh, moment for us all here at the University of Arizona. And I'm joined here today by a, a quite amazing panel. We were just having fun talking um, in the green room a moment ago. And, and this panel really brings together uh, the many and varied aspects of the story of this extraordinary painting. Um, its theft, uh, its recovery, its conservation, and now its, dis its display here in this gallery as part of the exhibition celebrating its return that will open to the public on Saturday. So I'd like to begin by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves, and then we'll open it up for questions. So um, Chief Seastone, we'll begin with you. I'm Brian Seastone. I'm the retired chief uh, from U of A and was the original investigator on this uh, a long time ago. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I am Leo Lamas. I'm the Deputy Special Agent in Charge for Homeland Security Investigations here in Tucson. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Tim Carpenter. I'm a Special Agent with the FBI. I'm the uh, former head of the FBI's Art Crime Program and currently uh, the Senior Advisor for that program today. Good afternoon. I'm Ulrich Bergmeier, the Head of pa Painting Conservation at the Getty Museum. and. Um, um, we've been working on, on this painting for the past um, three years or so. I'm Olivia Miller. I'm the interim director and curator of exhibitions here at the museum. And um, I was the lucky one in the right place at the right time to receive the phone call from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm David Van Ocker, and I'm one of the, one of three of the people who found the painting, and I'm the one who made the phone call to Olivia. <laughs> yeah. And if you'll be with, with us tonight for the film, you'll see many of these, these people in their Hollywood roles uh, <laughs> telling this remarkable story through um, the documentary, The Thief Collector. Uh, but now we're here with them in person. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And I, I think we'll just begin by, by opening up for any questions um, that, that you want to ask. And I'd ask that you tell us who you are and what your affiliation is uh, before you ask your question. Anyone begin? 
So maybe I'll begin, David, with you uh, and ask you, again, I think this is well known in many ways, but I love hearing this story. Uh, how did you first come into possession of this painting? Uh, and what was the moment like when you realized its backstory? Well, we had received a phone call from a gentleman who was um, settling the estate of his aunt and he had called us to see if we were interested in purchasing the con con contents of his aunt's home and we were not interested in purchasing the contents of his aunt's home. But luckily, he talked us into it and so um, the three of us, my uh, partner Buck Burns and our other business partner Rick Johnson, we all drove the oh, 40 miles or so out to the home of the altars and um, did a walkthrough and we, I actually walked into the master bedroom where the painting was hanging and it was hidden from us, but I um, had to kneel down to look at a piece of furniture and that caused me to close the bedroom door and that's when I saw the painting and, and, um, and I, I kind of liked it. I, I wasn't thrilled by it, but it was, it was okay. And um, <clears throat> so I actually ended up calling uh, my partner who was in another room to come and take a look at it and see if it was something that we might want to take home with us for our guest house. And um, anyway, then we ended up uh, bringing it back to our store and um, it was the first thing off the truck, so we had to kind of lean it up against the wall t to put back on the truck after it was, uh, after we unloaded all the, the stuff. And miraculously, within minutes, we actually had a customer that walked in the store who was a huge de Kooning fan. And he had just the day before moved to Silver City and walked in our store <laughs> and was absolutely positive that it was an authentic de Kooning. We, of course, laughed, and, um, but he, he was insistent that it was. He was followed by two other customers who had the same feeling, which kind of prompted us to um, investigate. And when the first customer actually came back and um, inquired about purchasing it again, um, you know, I just told him, I said, just make us an offer. And he said 200,000, and I said, sold. <laughs> because um, I seriously, I thought he was joking. And uh, he said, no, I'm dead serious, but you guys need to investigate it. So um, after the um, store kind of calmed down a little bit, uh, I went to the computer and our other partner, Buck, had pulled up de Kooning so that, you know, that would remind me when I sat down to, to investigate it. And um, when I went four pages into Google and pulled up the Arizona Republic article by Ann Ryman and saw the picture, <clears throat> my heart stopped. <laughs> and because I, I instantly knew that, that it was the same painting. I actually called uh, to our partner, Buck, to go and retrieve the painting from our bathroom where we had locked it away. <laughs> and, um, bring the painting out, we propped it up on the, the desk and started comparing all runs and drips and brush strokes. And um, yeah, we kind of went into panic mode about that time. <laughs> and, uh, and that's when I placed the phone call to Olivia. Great, so let's, so we're in the, kind of in the middle of the story. I'll just keep going for a minute. If people have questions, please raise your hands, I'll recognize you. But, but Olivia, um, let's back up for a second and maybe you could tell us a little bit about how the painting ended up here at the University of Arizona in the first place. And that story is of course told in this exhibition. So let's, that might be interesting for people to, it's a question that we're often asked. So maybe you could tell us just a little bit of that, of that backstory. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> prior to its theft in 1985, Woman Ochre had been in this museum for a very long time. Um, it was donated to us in 1958 by a man named Edward Gallagher Jr., who just a couple years prior had started um, a memorial collection at this museum. Um, so he was entranced by Arizona, even though he was from Baltimore, um, his connection to Arizona was that he liked to come out and visit. And um, after his only child had passed away, he was trying to figure out a way to honor the memory of his son. And so one of the ways he did that was by establishing the Edward Gallagher III Memorial Collection here. 
And um, over time, it grew to include 200 works of art, um, and Woman Ochre is an essential part of that collection. And, and actually, the exhibition in the other gallery features many works from the, from the Gallagher collection. It really demonstrates kind of the richness and variety um, in his collecting, especially of, of art from, from this period. Was that, was that the focus of Gallagher's collecting, was, was mid-century American art? It was, and I mean, for him at the time, um, he first made contact with the university in 1953. So of course, um, these were artists who were living at the same time. So for him, his goal was to build up a contemporary art collection um, at the university, um, which we now know as mid-century or um, abstract expressionism or a number of other movements that are part of the collection. Um, for him, he knew that it was difficult for a lot of people at that time in Tucson to be able to travel and um, have access to big museums, you know, that you might find on the East Coast. And so for him, it was important to have a strong collection here at the university that students and faculty mm -hmm. could use as a resource. Mm -hmm. Great. And so the painting was here happily for several decades until 1985 uh, when it was stolen. And I think that that story is fairly well known. We can, we can talk about that more. But, but Brian Seastone, you happen to have been here uh, then. You must have been about 11. Um, <laughs> seven. Seven, seven, sorry. Um, and you were, you were, of course, um, involved in that initial investigation um, and the response to that theft. And maybe, you could, maybe you could share a little bit about, about those experiences and maybe what some of the challenges were. As, I, mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I imagine you had been involved in many art crime cases. No, that was the first one. And um, it was an interesting day as the day <laughs> after Thanksgiving. The art museum had just opened. Um, and uh, I got a call probably around 10 o'clock from my boss, who's the chief, and said, you know, I think I need you to come to work today. Okay, and we came down and told us about the, the theft. And uh, from the moment I walked in, uh, I, I said, this is, a, this is something out of Hollywood, to be honest, just the way it happened. Uh, the right time, art museums just opening up, uh, two people come in, uh, a man and a woman, and we really weren't sure if it was a man or a woman uh, at the time, um, once we started our investigation. Um, a little talking went on downstairs while the gentleman went upstairs, and uh, a few minutes later he came down very quickly, and uh, they all exited. The street out here used to be open, and so there was this rust-colored car that was parked out there, and uh, they got into it, and that immediately drew some attention of the folks here, and they went upstairs and saw an empty frame, and that's how this all began. That, that day, uh, in the day after Thanksgiving, since that day has always been very special to me, um, because as I say, that day I got here, I saw tears of absolute sorrow, misbelief that this could happen here. And in the back of my mind, I, I said, we're gonna get this back one day. Uh, we had very little leads to go on. <clears throat> Our good friends from the FBI helped us out immediately uh, because we all know that uh, art usually does not stay where it was stolen. And um, <laughs> it went to st uh, stayed over. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were sure it was on the next plane out of the country. And between the FBI, Interpol, etc., we had very few leads, but we followed up on each one. And for the next 30-some years, every time there was a, a uh, art recovery, I'd call my friends at the FBI and say, is she in there? Mm -hmm. And they said no. <clears throat> and so uh, we were always hopeful. And then uh, in that wonderful day that I got a telephone call at four o'clock in the morning in Hawaii uh, when I was on vacation and my uh, and the uh, individual from the U of A on the other end said, have you heard about the art? And I go, oh God, not another one. And <laughs> it's back. And so for the next uh, 48 hours, we were kind of busy and we came back and um, um, it, it's been a remarkable story. When it came home, when we transported it back from uh, New Mexico, um, I reversed it and said, those tears of sorrow became the tears of joy and happiness. 
And uh, I gotta admit, it was uh, pretty emotional when I finally got to see it myself because I had seen it for many years on campus. And uh, to see it home, finally, um, if you look at the pictures, not this one, but from me then to now, uh, a lot has changed. But this thing is back and it's been restored a lot better than I have. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian, you mentioned, you mentioned the FBI and, and Tim Carpenter. Maybe we can turn to you for a moment and perhaps you could talk a little bit about both the, um, the FBI art crime team in general, um, this case, and how it compares maybe to other, other cases that, that you and, and that team have been involved with. Sure, there's a lot in that question right there. I'm gonna try to package that up. Uh, you'll hear this a lot today, so let me start by saying what an amazing story, right? I think we all agree. Uh, and we're happy and very proud in the FBI, the art crime program, to have played even a small part in this recovery. So it's really fantastic. Um, so as Chief Seaston said, we had uh, involvement in this case early on, right, in 1985. Uh, I think that theory that is the prevailing theory, right? When we see a piece like this stolen, we do expect to see it uh, traverse state lines. We, we expect this to traffic uh, at least within the United States, but hit the major art markets. And so uh, not surprisingly, uh, we broadened our net for this investigation uh, nationally and internationally, right? So we had uh, not only was the local field office here in Tucson working the investigation, but our offices in LA, New York, Miami, Chicago were all involved in this investigation, trying to generate leads, talking to sources, doing the things that we do to see if we could help locate uh, the painting. Unfortunately, we're un we were unsuccessful. Um, to the question, that's not uh, overly unusual in an art crime case. Uh, we're, we're, we do expect to see paintings like this go to ground for some time. It's not uncommon to see them disappear for decades. And so when these types of situations occur and we have good Samaritans that come forward with the information and do the right thing for the right reasons, what a great way uh, to cap off one of those long, stale investigations, right? So we're really thankful <coughs> to you, sir, for that. Um, and it uh, just speaks to the fact that there are really good Samaritans out there still, and uh, thank you. Um, to the art crime team, just for a moment, uh, for your question, so many of you may not be aware that the FBI does have a specialized unit uh, that does investigate art and cultural property crime. Uh, the team is relatively new, founded in 2005, not to suggest, though, that we didn't work art crime cases before that. Clearly, we did. We've been working art crime and cultural property crime cases for decades. Uh, but it was in 2005 when we decided that we needed to develop <coughs> organic expertise. And so I'll summarize it by saying that our role is to conduct not only our own art and cultural property crime investigations, but to assist and support other FBI offices that may not have an art crime investigator in that office, but our federal partners and our state and local and our international law, law enforcement partners as well that may not have that organic expertise. We're trying to be a force multiplier. We come in and offer our assistance and our knowledge of the market uh, and hope that we can generate great success stories like this. Thank you so much. So the painting was recovered, uh, and that's about the time I arrived at, at the University of Arizona. I came in 2018, and at that time, the partnership had been, had been formed with the Getty. Um, Ulrich Berkmeyer um, led, that, led those efforts along with Tom Lerner, who will be here tomorrow. Um, Ulrich, and maybe Olivia, too, you could talk, maybe you could talk a little bit about, I'll start with you, Olivia. How did the partnership with the Getty emerge? How did, how did, how did we, or the university, and the museum decide that the Getty was the right institution to partner with? And what were some of the pieces of that, um, of that process that might be interesting to share? Yeah, so um, when the painting came back, our interim director at the time, Meg Haggard, who's here, um, she called the Willem de Kooning mm -hmm. Foundation, um, which was a great move because, um, quite frankly, we were a bit overwhelmed, you know, as much as we hoped and prayed this painting would come back, um, the reality of it coming back also presented us with a whole number of things that we had to deal with, um, in particular knowing that it came back to us in very dire condition. Um, so the de Kooning Foundation, um, Amy Schichtel, the executive director, helped us assemble a team of de Kooning experts. So John Elderfield, who um, did the retrospective exhibition <coughs> at MoMA, um, 
as well as Susan Lake, who um, was the chief conservator at the Hirshhorn Museum. She has since retired. Um, so after getting these experts together, you know, in conversation, I think it was Susan who said, you know, I've worked with the Getty. I published a book on de Kooning's materials with them. You know, this, this sounds like a project that they might be interested in. And so with that, we were able to start that conversation. Um, Ulrich had not yet started at the time, um, but Tom Lerner came out and did an initial visit and met with us, and he was like, yes, this is a really neat project, this is something that would be beneficial for, for both of our museums, and once our new um, senior paintings conservator arrives, I'm going to tell him all about it. And so, that's where you come in. Yeah. And just quickly to mention, so Tom Lerner's name was mentioned, he is the head of science at the Getty Conservation Institute. Uh, and I think he'll be joining us tomorrow. So yeah. let, me, let me ask you specifically, Ulrich, um, uh, in this particular case, uh, this was a patient in kind of you know, critical condition. I think we've sort of been playing around with those kinds of like healthcare metaphors a little bit and thinking about, and paintings are living, breathing things in interesting ways, as, as yeah. you know better than I do. Um, but let me ask you in particular, uh, what, what's the process for the Getty Museum and, and the Conservation Lab to take on a project like this? And what were the particular challenges you faced? Um, and then maybe third, how did, you, how did you address those challenges? So maybe those, those three elements might yeah. be interesting to hear some about. There were certainly big challenges because, um, as you mentioned, the, um, <laughs> the patient was on life support, if you will. <laughs> and, um, and as you said, it, it was in rather dire condition, actually. So. Um, we, when we first saw the painting um, here um, um, at the museum in 2018, um, December of 2018, I think both Tom and I, we took a deep breath and thought, okay, this is, this is going to be a very challenging um, um, project. But um, when the painting first came to the Getty, um, we started um, with examining the painting um, documenting the condition, um, every detail. Um, we performed a technical examination, um, which would inform the treatment plan um, that we had devised um, subsequently. So um, then um, we started working in, in earnest on the painting, um, which was very time consuming, um, as you can imagine. Um, you see the condition of the painting in some details, um, to your right there. Um, so this is what we were facing, and um, we were facing this um, basically under the microscope. So my colleague, um, Laura Rivers, um, associate paintings conservator at the Getty, um, spent about <coughs> two years under the microscope setting down um, each tiny flake of paint um, that was at risk of um, flaking off. And um, um, after that, um, we remarried um, the, the tacking margins, as we call them, the borders that had been cut off um, the painting um, with the painting um, itself. And um, we filled all the losses um, of paint and um, um, finally retouched um, all the tiny losses of paint. Mm -hmm. um, and so f um, it took about, I want to say, two and a half years um, also because COVID um, happened in between and so um, we were not <coughs> able to f work on the painting every day um, as much as we yeah, yeah. Um, would have liked to. Yeah. And there's a quite amazing video, I'm not sure if it'll be in one of these monitors during the exhibition, we can probably make that available to the press I would imagine, um, that really um, tells the story and demonstrates the methods you used in, in really remarkable ways, yeah. it really is a marriage of of art and science. I should mention that um, this would, the costs were underwritten by philanthropy from the Getty. Uh, this is not something that we as a university were asked to pay for and we're incredibly grateful and will always be for the generosity of the J. Paul Getty Museum in that regard. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you take on these kinds of projects. This yeah. is not the first example yeah. and, and um, again, we're benefiting from, I think, a, a, an established way that, that you and, and the museum and the conservation lab have yeah. been working. Yeah. I mean, we were honored that you <coughs> entrusted us with, the, with, with this important work in the first place, and um, we're able to take on these um, projects like the de Kooning um, as part of um, this group of supporters, um, the Paintings Council, 
that um, lends financial support to enable us to take on um, important conservation projects like um, de Kooning's um, Woman Ochre. Um, and um, it um, allows us to really make, um, take advantage of, um, of every part of the Getty, um, the Getty Conservation Institute, um, the conservation scientists there, um, educators, curators, um, so it, it really takes a village, um, but um, after yeah. two and a half years, um, it all came together and um, the result is behind us. Spectacular, yeah, yeah, thank you. So, um, Neil, Neil Lamas, I'll, I'll turn to you now, and, and thankful to have Homeland Security also be part of the story. And I saw a great story posted on your website, by the way, for sure. the, of, the, of the department. Um, you know, I, I would imagine the public at large is not really aware of the role that Homeland Security um, plays in, in um, you know, um, efforts like the repatriation of cultural artifacts. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that role. Yeah, and absolutely. maybe a little bit also about how you became involved in this particular project. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, our agency is called Homeland Security Investigations, or HSI. <coughs> and uh, being that we're a mere 70 miles from the U.S.-Mexican border here, people commonly know us as being involved in the combat against drug trafficking, human smuggling, money laundering, firearms trafficking. Uh, what is not commonly known about HSI is that for quite a long period of time, much like my associate from the FBI, we have a, a cultural arts and antiquities program in, uh, in which we try to repatriate uh, works of art and stolen items either back to museums or back to foreign countries. Because of our customs authorities, they may either be stolen in the United States and taken out to sell in a foreign country or they're stolen from a foreign government and brought here to sell. So uh, we work with our federal partners, we work with state and local uh, departments. So a couple months ago, Mike, my colleague who was here came in and said, hey, um, we've been meeting with uh, University of Arizona um, uh, and told me all about this, this unbelievable story <laughs> which I wasn't even aware of. Um, so I was overjoyed to hear it because, um, you know, this university is such a vital part of the state of Arizona. It's so important to the city of Tucson. Um, I mean, I work with a number of agents who graduated from here. I work with a number of agents who have <clears throat> kids that currently go here. Uh, so for us to do anything at all to be part of this university is very, very important to us. So although we were not involved in the investigation uh, that was conducted when this thing was stolen, um, our concern when we were talking to the University of Arizona was we don't want this to happen again. Uh, so obviously, um, the museum had its resources to bring the work of art back here safely. Um, but my colleagues said, well, we're going to make sure that nothing happens to it while it's being brought back here. So they traveled to the Getty Museum. Uh, they supervised the loading of this thing. And we had a number of agents on pretty heavy guard bring this back. <laughs> and um, no major incidents happened. <laughs> So it's here, and again, we're just very thankful to be part of this. It's, uh, it's a really important and, and, and monumental moment. Thank you so much for your partnership on yes, this. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Uh, Olivia, I'm going to turn back to you for one last question, then I'll open it up. We'll have plenty of time for, for questions. But maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, what's next? We know the uh, exhibition runs through May 20th, and maybe you can tell us what happens after that with, with the painting and some exciting plans we've just announced recently. <laughs> yes, um, so this special exhibition tells all about the full life and history of this painting, the very incredible journey it's had. Um, but after this exhibition comes down, we're really excited um, to actually put it back upstairs. It'll be in the same gallery, hanging on the very same wall that it was, that it was stolen from. Um, but there's going to be one significant change in that gallery, and that is that we are officially changing the name of the gallery to the Manzanita Ridge Gallery. Um, this is an official name change um, by the university and the, the U of A Foundation um, that will honor um, this act of kindness from David, Buck, and Rick in, in perpetuity so that we can remember the story, you know, as part of our university history for all the years to come. Very exciting. That's, That's great. Yeah. That's great. Congratulations, David. How, what's your reaction to that? Well, um, <laughs> I'm almost speechless. <laughs> um, and, uh, 
I, I'm pretty much speechless. <laughs> and, and again, thank you, Olivia, for every time we're together, she makes me cry. <laughs> every time. And I swore this time she wouldn't, and she did again. So um, yeah, I'm 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 beyond honored. I'm we're so very thankful. We're so very thankful to all three of you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we all wouldn't be here um, if it weren't for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's one other change. I think there's some cameras up there now. <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Just want to point that out. Very significant change. <laughs> Charles, I know you've had a question, so we'll start with you, and then we'll open it up. No, um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, very good question. So no, we were able to, um, you know, um, set down all the um, all the lifting um, paint that you can see here in the photograph next to you, um, in a process that, um, as I mentioned earlier, took a very very long time, um, and we were able to uh, reunite the um, the two pieces of canvas. So the canvas that had been cut out. Um, we were able to reunite with the um, with the borders um, that luckily um, were retained because I, I understand um, at the time um, someone said, "Well, maybe this this painting is going to one day appear again," and um, as it did, and um, so we were able to um, basically um, rejoin um, those those two pieces and. Um, eventually stretched them over um, a new stretcher. And um, so it retains its original format. So it's pretty much back to um, where it was, um, <coughs> except for you know some of the little scars um, you'll always see. Um, you cannot make it completely invisible, but um, mm -hmm. I think from a um, normal viewing distance, um, it appears as if you know nothing had ever happened to it. Although we all know um, a lot did happen. <laughs> Other questions? Anne? So the FBI investigation has been closed in this case. Um, what can you tell us and what did you conclude from your investigations of anterior radiology? Well, we have closed the investigation. Of course, as with any investigation that we conduct, uh, we're always happy to reopen uh, an investigation if new evidence comes forward uh, that uh, is something that we could pursue. So unfortunately, in this case, we've exhausted all logical investigative leads. Uh, as to the alters, uh, I'm afraid uh, the alters are the only, only ones that really truly know uh, the truth and the facts about how they came into possession of this painting and they took that to the grave with them. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes? Did you find any other um, storms uh, on the property or any marks? We did not. Mm -hmm. Could you just give some background on the artist for those who are? Sure, I'll let Olivia Miller um, Talk a little bit about Willem de Kooning. Sure, yeah, Willem de Kooning, um, he was actually born in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and um, he had a, a fairly difficult upbringing, um, a lot of issues with, with his parents, um, very close relationship with his older sister, though. Um, but he showed, you know, technical proficiency in art at quite a young age, and so he was, um, Around the age of 12 or 13, he was apprenticed um, to a design firm, and so he was able to work and kind of hone his skills, um, trained at the academy. So he had a fairly traditional training. Um, around the age of 20, he was a bit restless, and I would say all his life he was probably kind of a restless figure. Um, and he decided to stow away on a ship and uh, was quite lured by the American dream. And so he hid out in the engine room of a ship and came to the United States. He eventually settled in Manhattan, um, and that's where his artistic development, you could say, really sort of blossomed there. Um, he was, 
you know, part of this really incredible movement of, of art that emerged after World War II. Um, so a lot of people categorize him as an abstract expressionist artist. You might be familiar with Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko, um, you know, really part of this movement where they were moving further away from realistic representation, um, more interested in sort of the process and the materiality of paint and the sort of physical way that somebody can make an artwork. Um, and he lived a very long life um, he'd, and worked almost until the end and he died in the 90s, mm -hmm. so. Ulrich, what about, um, what if anything about de Kooning's working methods um, presented particular challenges as you approach this, this treatment? Yeah, um, as um, every contemporary or modern artist, um, we often are faced with um, some unconventional um, painting techniques or uh, material choices. Um, which was the case also with um, de Kooning, as um, Olivia mentioned. Um, well, actually, um, when he first came to the, to the United States, he worked as a house painter. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was very familiar with, um, with industrial paints, um, which sort of found its way also in his own painting technique and uh, material choices. So just like um, the other um, giant of um, abstract <coughs> expressionism, um, Jackson Pollock, he used um, house paint um, extensively in his paintings. And um, you can find that also um, in this. So it's a mixture of um, traditional uh, two paints, um, but mixed with um, some house paint as well. Um, it would just very different would have very different handling properties, um, which can make it um, um, tricky for us when we um, devise a treatment plan um, because the various paints uh, react differently um, to um, the conservation um, treatments we um, we perform to um, during the cleaning of the painting and so on. So um, it is um, it is not always very straightforward. Mm -hmm. Olivia mentioned part of what was interesting about the Getty was the research that had been done on de Kooning's techniques, and of course a book was published about that by the Getty. What if any discoveries were made about de Kooning's techniques and his manner of painting during this project that, that, that were new and not known before? I think um, we're pretty much able to confirm the findings um, of Susan Lake. Um, um, so, as you had mentioned, um, she was previously um, the head of conservation at the Hirshhorn <coughs> Museum in Washington, D.C. And um, um, all the materials we found um, on this painting um, were actually very much in keeping um, with the findings um, she made in this um, publication from um, about 10 years ago. Um, so, f no big surprises, yeah. but on the other <coughs> hand, every painting uh, presents its own challenges, and so you spend weeks and months um, um, documenting, um, looking at the work, um, examining um, each detail, each technical detail of the painting in order to um, be able to devise a, a treatment plan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. So David, how have things changed up there in Silver City? since you uh, came across this painting in 2017? Well, my business has quadrupled. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always nice. Um, you know, it, it's, it's actually kind of amazing. It's been five years and we still, at least once a week, usually more than once a week, but at least once a week, somebody comes into our store that uh, just wants to meet us. Um, we've had people who have who've been traveling in the Southwest and put us on their itinerary just to, to come to Silver City, just to come into our store. Yeah. And they usually buy something. Um, and we've, we continue to get phone calls from all over the world. Just people, you know, when they hear about the story, just wanting to, to say thank you or something like that. Um, it, it's, it, it's been really a nice positive uh, a tremendously positive thing mm -hmm. for our business and our town as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. You Are know, the, the fact that, that three people recognize <laughs> a, a real de Kooning within two hours is pretty amazing <laughs> for, a, you know, a teeny little town in New yeah. Mexico. Are you getting so. people now who've seen the film? 
Uh, we've had a few people that have seen the film, yes. Come in, uh, somebody actually came in from, uh, I think, Washington or Oregon. They had, uh, they had seen the film, no, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. They were in San Francisco and had seen the film and decided to make a, a trip out <coughs> to uh, New Mexico and came to Silver City to meet yeah. us from Fantastic. seeing the film. Yeah. Other questions? I think we have someone on this panel who could do that. <laughs> um, yes, so I, when I got the call from David, um, it was a Thursday afternoon. It, the next morning I spoke with um, Special Agent Merida Savona from the <laughs> FBI art crime team. And she said, um, yes, we're gonna work through this and get the painting back. By this time, poor David has already lost his mind yes. um, with <laughs> yeah. nerves and is wondering if we're coming to get it. Um, kind of a long story short, um, Meg Haggard, so she was our interim director at the time, um, she and I drove in her minivan and we brought a crate with us. And then we had um, another cohort of staff in another vehicle, so, um, um, Chelsea Farrar and Nathan Saxton and Jill McCleary were in another car. And so we kind of caravanned to Silver City and got there around 11 o'clock at night or so. And, um, and it was dramatic, it was raining and we were stressed. And um, I was on, um, I was texting with the Office of General Counsel the whole way and the Grant County Sheriff was there to welcome us and meet us there. Um, and when we got there, we, we honestly didn't fully know what to expect. You know, I, I think about now what I know about David and Buck and Rick, and I laugh at how nervous I was um, walking in there. But, you know, the first thing was Buck gave me a hug, and then David gave me a hug, and there were all these people there. And, um, and then we went and we, we saw the painting, and, you know, we're able to pack it up, and then we stored it over the weekend at the Grant County Sheriff's Station in their evidence vault. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Meg Haggard is here, yes. right in the second row, and if people want to talk with her afterwards, I'm sure you'd be happy to share your experiences. You were the interim director at the time all of this happened, and you were, was it your minivan? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. 2005 <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have it? <laughs> did, did you know at the time that, um, were you convinced that it was the painting? I was, 100%. Um, you know, after David had called, you know, I told him to email me photos. And I, we have those photos on display here. So Buck immediately started emailing all these photos because I wanted to make sure it wasn't a reproduction, first and foremost. Um, and then once they told me the dimensions and they were only an inch off, you know, they said, oh, it's 29 by 39 inches. We were like, okay. So we called Meg, I think Meg was in a meeting and she said, do you think it's real? And I said, yes. And she said, okay, call UAPD. And that's what kind of got the ball rolling. And then um, seeing it in person just confirmed it, you know, just to be sure. So we didn't embarrass ourselves, you know, bringing back a painting that wasn't actually the real one. Um, when we brought the painting back, we let it acclimate. Um, and so a couple days later, we invited um, Dr. Nancy Odegaard, an incredible conservator um, here on this campus at the Arizona State Museum. And she came over to do a preliminary authentication to essentially assess the painting's overall condition and to confirm whether or not this was the same object that was stolen from this museum. So after a thorough two-hour inspection, she placed the painting on top of the remnants that we had always maintained those past 32 years, and it just fit perfectly. It was really like a puzzle. The cuts matched up, the paint strokes that had been sliced through matched up. It just, it was without a doubt, the painting. Yeah. And there are some pictures of Nancy doing that on the wall here as part of the exhibition. Yeah. Any other? Yes, please. I can tell you that, again, we conducted logical investigation, right? So we, that means we conducted numerous interviews and we examined documents and records. Um, <clears throat> but again, I, all I can say is the alters are the only, one that, the only ones that know how they came into possession of the painting. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't have the answer to that. 
So. I'm not going to comment on that. We, we just don't know. I'll say the film, spec I don't know if you've seen the film yet, the, the thief collector speculates on many of these questions. I just have to ask. Yeah, no, Chris. <laughs> 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 yeah. We all want to ask. Thank you, for, yeah. do, thank you for doing that. <laughs> you're, you're not the first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Anything that the panelists want to add that we haven't, we haven't covered or or talked about that um, you want to um, share in this context? Well, I'll, I'll talk about the night that Olivia came and, and the rest of the people from the U of A came to pick up the painting. One thing that she fails to mention is she entered into a home full of drunk people <laughs> with a dog running around. And not our doing, I, I <laughs> might add. We had nothing to do with that. but. Um, by the time the, the U of A showed up, I was thinking, oh my God, you know, what are they walking into? Because there were, <clears throat> oh gosh, probably what, 20 people there? Um, the, the place where we had stashed the painting to hide it, um, unbeknownst to us, the, the uh, gentleman who was holding it for us decided that he would have kind of a surprise party for the university. And um, yeah, by the time, <clears throat> By the time Meg and Olivia and everyone showed up, they were pretty toasted. And, and like I said, there was a dog. There was a dog running around, and we were, you know, wow. just. It, it was a little nerve wracking for us all. So yeah, it, the um, the sheriff. Uh, when we were on our way, he calls and he goes, um, "There's a lot of people here. Are you? Were you expecting that? There's a lot of cars here." And I was like, "I don't know what's going on, but we're mm -hmm. gonna." Where are you going to go with it? Mm -hmm. And then Meg kindly asked them to remove the dog yeah. from the room. So. <laughs> <laughs> so in the spirit of having to ask the question, didn't you think even for a moment about keeping it? Honestly, no. <laughs> Seriously. Right. Honestly. And, and Buck will tell you the same thing. Yeah. It was, it, it all happened so quickly. Um, and, and I try and describe it. The only way I can describe it is, is the moment, because we, seriously, we, we knew in our hearts, as soon as we started comparing, we knew that it was, it was it. And it was just almost like we had this download of absolute, the next thing to do is to call the museum. Mm -hmm. and, and it has to go back, it, it just has to go back. Um, and, you know, after reading the, the uh, Ann Ryman's art, uh, 2015, article, I mean, it just almost like pulled at your heart. Mm -hmm. And we just had this sense come over us that we have been put in the position to write a serious wrong. Mm -hmm. And how many people get to do that? I mean, oh my God, this has been an amazing experience. And, and we, we got to do this, you know? And, and uh, so no, we, I can, I can say <clears throat> 100% that we didn't have one second that we thought about keeping it. Now, a year later, you know, <laughs> then, no, seriously, we, we, we never did, and we are thrilled. I mean, look at this, yeah. you know. Yeah. Gosh, you know, we got to have a hand in this happening, and yeah. I mean, what could be greater than that? Yeah, so. that's great. You mentioned Ann Ryman's article in, in 2015. Olivia, maybe one thing that we close out on is the decision um, to, um, commemorate the anniversary, and maybe you can talk about how that, how the museum did that and, and why, and obviously it resulted in, in this uh, ability to find information when the painting was recovered. So maybe you can just talk about that aspect for a second. Yeah, so that actually, that conversation to hold that event really started in 2012. Um, so at the time, we had a, um, a wonderful curator here, Lauren Rabb, and she had been reading um, a book about art crime and this sort of idea of generations passing and artwork coming sort of back to the surface and people maybe not knowing what they had, you know, that really caught her attention. And so, you know, she's the one who kind of started the energy behind this and said, oh my gosh, let's open the file, let's read the police report, let's contact the FBI. Um, and so all of us just kind of followed her lead. So even um, after she left the museum in 2015, we said, well, it's the 30th anniversary. This painting was stolen before the internet. Um, so although it was on the FBI art crime database, um, the stolen art 
file, um, if you weren't there looking for it, you wouldn't necessarily find it in a regular Google search. Um, so we decided to hold this event about art crime. We talked about um, the forgeries in our collection. That's another tale. Um, and then Meredith Savona from the art crime team came out to talk about the art crime team um, at the FBI. And, um, and then our registrar, uh, Kristen Schmidt, talked specifically about the theft of woman ochre. And we, you know, I think just being here in a press conference is really sort of full circle. It really demonstrates how important it is to share the story, even if um, you have to, you know, admit to some, you know, lacking security in 1985. It demonstrates um, the importance of the media in sharing stories about <clears throat> cultural heritage, um, because had this story not circulated around the world, David never would have found it in a Google search, would never have known what he had. And so we're just so grateful that, um, that the media found this story worthy of sharing with the public and that it spread so far. Mm -hmm. can't even say. I, it was uh, pretty amazing because when I, I got the call uh, that it had been recovered, I thought, great, it's in London and I'm going to have a great trip going over <laughs> and getting it. Uh, wrong. It's Silver City. And yeah, I, I was completely taken back. You know, um, and I know my colleagues here will attest, there's usually, it, it pops back up when there's a death. Uh, somebody turns on somebody or just out of a freak accident and you know it, it just came together a death out of this um, it, it was really just an amazing experience and and I think that one of the first things I told Olivia uh, when I, I saw her was if if she could ever talk she has an incredible story to tell I want to add that Silver City is the London of New Mexico. <laughs> I've learned that, so you know. A and Paris. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe that's a good note to end on. Uh, <laughs> if there's another question that we could certainly entertain it. Otherwise, I want to thank all of you, not only for being here today, but for the critical roles that each, each of you have, have played in this remarkable story, which we're thrilled to be telling um, in this exhibition, uh, which will be up through May 20th, opens on Saturday, and then of course we get to keep the painting forever. So we're, we're thrilled with that, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, we appreciate your, your interest, and, um, and thanks again. Thank you. such brilliant comedic timing. <laughs> <laughs>